the king of ventriloquism and a preview of our live Van Haven episode. I'm Matt Bailey and this is Ventriloquism Weekly. Yo, 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 welcome into the show. Did you like that? Okay, never mind. We have an amazing guest today, Sammy King. Sammy King is known worldwide for his 12-minute act with Francisco the Mexican Parrot, and he has performed his act any place you could imagine, truly, from Palm Springs to Paris, here to talk about what he's learned in over half a century of treading the boards, our interview with the amazing Sammy King. Sammy King, welcome to Ventriloquism Weekly. How are you today, sir? I'm fine, Matt. Thank you, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Well, thank you for accepting the invitation. It's great to have you. And I just want to jump right in with the uh, question I always start with. We begin at the beginning. How did you get started in ventriloquism? Um, well, I was nine years old, and uh, in my hometown, Brownsville, Texas, there was no television. Oh, I was listening to Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy's radio show. And um, I, I listened to a couple of them, and I asked my mother if that was one person doing both voices. And she said, yeah, he's a ventriloquist. And I said, what's a ventriloquist? She said, well, he's got kind of a doll, a mannequin, and a dummy, and, uh, and he does the talking for him. And I could kind of picture what that was. And uh, I sat my younger brother, Morty, on my lap and would squeeze the back of his neck, open and shut his <laughs> mouth. And that was my first dummy. And it was just kind of something I knew I could do. Your older brother is the first dummy. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> so when did you get your first figure then? When did that come into the picture? Uh, well, my mother saw that I was really interested in that. And so she got me... Um, first one was a factory made uh, a dummy dam and uh, so I guess I was about nine or ten and then after that I went to the oh I, I guess the replicas of Charlie McCarthy, Jerry Mahoney and Daniel Day and uh, finally by the time I was 11 or 12 um, I wanted an original figure and she had one made in Mexico for me and uh the characters, I named him Teddy, so it would be kind of like Charlie and Jerry and Dave, and that's pretty much how I started. That's wonderful. Where were some of your, your first shows when you were starting and you got those figures and you put routines together? Well, in my hometown, Brownsville, Texas, which is way down on the Mexican border, mm -hmm. um, the snowbirds would come down every winter in their trailers, and there was a trailer park there called the Los Amigos Trailer Park, and they had a recreation hall. And on Saturday nights, they would um, have dances and entertainment. And so I, uh, it was nearby, and I would go down there. And uh, so I, I took uh, Eddie along with me one night, and they took me on stage. And I did, well, actually it was a um, Charlie McCarthy routine that I'd heard on radio. So uh, that was the first show that I did. And the next couple of years, I would go down there, oh, every other month or so. And uh, uh, pretty soon, my mother was taking me around to civic clubs and uh, occasional private parties and veterans' hospitals, that sort of thing. That's wonderful, wonderful. And it's it's always so interesting to hear how ventriloquists get their start because here you are, uh, a couple of years later, you end up, you start playing Las Vegas. Can you talk about how you first got introduced to uh, to Sin City and started to play in Las Vegas? Well, uh, the first year I went to Las Vegas was 1968. But um, prior to going in order to really build an act and get some experience, I'd uh, I joined the Navy in 1958. Well, thank you for your service. Uh, I wasn't a very good student. I was popular though. <laughs> I was voted most popular freshman four years in a row. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah. But so I joined the Navy and uh, found my way into special services. And so I would uh, 
was in San Diego station there, and I would perform with the Navy band and, and got some experience. Then when I got out, um, I did go to college for a couple of years, but I wasn't a good student, like I said. So um, I auditioned for um, USO shows and, um, and got in, and I spent five years traveling on USO tours, which is where I first really developed the act. And, and got some experience. So then, when I when I went to Vegas, um, I was booked into uh, the Dunes Hotel had a, a lounge. There was a show there called Viva Girls, and uh, that was my first uh, introduction to Vegas. That's great. And uh, when did you fall in love and say, "I I want to play here for for a while. This is where I'd like to be." I'm sorry, I missed that. What was your oh, question? Oh, no, that's fine. I said, uh, was there something that happened to you that you said, I'd like to stay here, I'd like to I'd like to perform in a review show uh, in this town? Did did something click with you? Well, uh, yeah, they wanted, um, they wanted a 10 to 12 minute act is all. So um, I thought that the, the, the bit that I did with Francisco was probably... Uh, best suited for that, and um, I had, like I said, developed it on USO tours. So um, when when I got to Vegas, yeah, it was it was a great time back in the sixties. Uh, Russ Lewis was playing the main room at the Dunes mm-hmm. uh, in the Casino de Paris, and um, Jay Nemeth was at the Holiday. Stu Scott was at the Hacienda. Dick Weston was in the Lido show at the Stardust. So most of the uh, main rooms had uh, either a production show, a uh, Paris-style production show, or uh, they would have stars with uh, opening acts during about 20 minutes. But I I like to perform, and so I, I stayed in that uh, production show format, which meant that that was a 10- to 12-minute act, and uh, but you would get you know long runs a, a year at a time contract so that's how i got to do so many shows now that yeah you you mentioned francisco and developing him on the uso tours i want to i want to dedicate a, a bulk here to francisco because i have never seen uh, when i was coming up you were the first example of a set act that is, that is the act and you work the material and that's the material that you work and you have it and you know it like the back in front of your hand what appealed to you uh, with regards to that developing a set act that you would do over and over again, as opposed to having a character that, as Russ talked about when we had him, that sort of evolves over the lifetime of a of a career? Well, um, I suppose it was you know supply and demand. They didn't. Uh, the production shows had to run an exact amount of time, usually about an hour and fifteen minutes give or take a minute or two. So there wasn't really, um, uh, in that format, there wasn't a lot of latitude for experimenting or changing much so that the, the, the act that everyone did, they just pretty much performed over and over. Mm-hmm. And I just had to find new and interesting ways of, of doing it just to stay on top of it. The, um, yeah, the, the first Francisco that I ever did was, I was uh, when I got out of the Navy, I was working at the Houston Theater Center in Texas. And it's curious how many good ventriloquists come out of Texas. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, guys like, uh, even the famous ones like Jeff Dunham and Jay Johnson, Terry Sater. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Every, I don't know. It must be the water down there or something. Yeah, I was just going to ask, what's in the what is in the water in Texas that the ventriloquists <laughs> drink? Yeah, you can drink it without moving your lips and sing at the same time. Yeah, hey, Mark Wade, stop <laughs> having Van Haven in Kentucky. Have it in Texas. Let's see what happens. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of guys went down there just I think just because of that. I don't know. Anyway, um, so I. I there, there was a guy in the 60s, uh, Bill Dana, who had a, uh, he created a popular Mexican character on the Steve Allen show, uh, Jose Jimenez. And um, uh, I thought that was really uh, clever. It was funny, and, and I was fluent in Spanish. 
So um, I kind of use that characterization. And also in 1961, I think it was 61, the Four Preps a Singing Quartet had a, a semi hit recording of the old Mexican folk song, La Cucaracha. So I kind of converted that into a nightclub act uh, using the script to tell the story of a cockroach who was actually a hooker. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and also uh, growing up on the Mexican border, I always loved the sound of Spanish guitars. Mm. And I started teaching myself how to play. And by the time I started working with U.S. host shows, I was playing uh, like Malagueña, which is probably the most popular, well-known Spanish guitar solo. Yeah. And um, I was doing, I would do it separately. I would do Francisco and then Malagueña. But I had Francisco in a cage next to me, and I was playing Malagueña and broke a string one night. And I uh, didn't know what to do, and out of nowhere, uh, the jumped in with a distant voice of Francisco, asked me, what are you going to do now, gringo? And it got a big laugh. So um, that was what kind of sparked the idea. And uh, then it was an evolution of lines that grew and grew until it kind of became the classic act that I did on a lot of TV shows. Yes. Uh, yeah, back in the 70s, I was probably on one a uh, major network TV show or another every other month. Yeah. And so from there, I uh, that was pretty much uh, how I got to do that. And like I say, uh, I, I really like the idea of working 50 weeks a year uh, and, and not having so many split weeks where I was you know, downtime. Mm -hmm. So I averaged about 500 shows a year uh, for most of my career. That's, in um, a lot of places all over the world, really. That's an incredible. That's incredible achievement, and especially I want to touch on the television. Um, I believe this. It's been a. It's been a few years since I've I've seen you talk about Francisco at conventions. So, uh, so forgive me as as my memory is a bit foggy. But I remember you mentioning something about the the longer twelve minute act, and then for other things, a, a shorter maybe eight or nine minute act or, or version of it. When you would encounter those situations. What what do you do when you go back and you look through that piece and you say, okay, what are you going through when you say, okay, this is what I'm going to cut? How do you decide what you have to cut to kind of bring it down for time when you're in those situations? Yeah, that's that's a great question, which is always kind of a dilemma for me because uh, that 12-minute bit that I did with Francisco was kind of like a set theatrical book act. And it was very difficult for me to pick out certain lines because uh, I I never really had jokes per se. It was uh, you know just an act about starting or wanting to do an act, and it never got around to doing anything. And uh, so it was difficult to transition into. And most of the the shows, like um, Ed Sullivan or. Um, I don't know, there was a whole bunch of Merv Griffin shows, I did a bunch of those, mm -hmm. and they would limit you to five minutes, four and a half to five minutes. It was really kind of difficult, and in fact, I never really liked anything I ever did on television. I think uh, probably the Jerry Lewis telephone that he does on Labor Day, I think I got a little more time there, and there was an HBO special called Dummies, where they, they gave me, a, I think it was seven or eight minutes, and uh, an NBC talent showcase, which back in the 70s was kind of the version of America's Got Talent. And uh, they, they gave me seven to eight minutes, which I really, rather than cut out or select certain lines, I kind of compressed the act by just performing it faster, <laughs> but I, I never really cared for anything I ever did on television. I think that was probably one of Las Vegas' first acts to turn down The Tonight Show, well, simply because I, they wouldn't allow me to do, uh, I could do it in eight to ten minutes comfortably, but because I rushed everything, I can't stand to even look at any uh videos of my performance, TV performances, because it was just not 
you know, what I normally did in front of a live audience. And I never learned to play the camera very well. I was a, a live cabaret performer. So that's why I really didn't, never liked the television shows I did. I did a bunch of them for sure. Oh, yeah. In those days, they had, yeah, there were Donald O'Connor and Art Link Letters show. And, and I'm, and I'm certain, given your skill and your talent, that what what uh, I'm sure it went over extremely well for the audiences. But it's funny as a performer when you know that it's not how you normally do something, you know, and you go, mm, "That's not how I do it." But okay, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things that that it's it's a personal thing. But I'm sure, given your talent, they all played very very well. I guess so, because it certainly didn't uh, hurt my career any. Of course. Um, however, I, I must say that uh, television didn't do so much for me as uh, just being seen on stage. And, um, for example, the, uh, the 10 years that I worked the Crazy Horse Saloon in Paris was just the result of the uh, producers seeing me in Lake Tahoe in a show. And um, so, and, and most of them, one would lead to another, to another, and so forth. Uh, I guess television didn't hurt any, but uh, most of my long-run contracts uh, were, you know, one to two years at a time, and they were a result of just being seen in, in another venue. What are the benefits of doing a uh, of a set twelve minute act? What can a what a, what would you like to say to ventriloquists that are thinking about doing a set uh, act and not changing it? Well, it, um, if you hone something down to a classic format, um, you don't have all those pauses and stammering, and you know you can take a, a line and deliver it uh, 10 different ways, you know, depending on what words you punch or what accents or uh, takes and double takes. There's just so many ways of doing the same thing. But uh, when you find the best way, you lock into it, and there's a tendency to not vary it too much. You know, it's like um, the difference in, in making something funny and funnier can be as simple as, putting the accent on the right syllable, if you will. <laughs> yes. Yes. And so was there ever a time in your performing of Francisco, of the of that classic act, where you kind of had to do something uh, within how you uh, presented the act drastically different than what you had gotten used to? Or were you ever put into that kind of a situation? Oh, yeah. Well, when, uh, when I was asked what I had to do... For example, in, in some of the early comedy clubs and um, or concert dates where I'd have to do 30 or 40 minutes, 45 even, then I would stretch Francisco, add some things in between lines, but it didn't necessarily make it better. It just made it longer. It wasn't... It wasn't in fact, I would I could say that it made it worse, the reaction, overall reaction. It didn't have that element of leaving him wanting more. Right. In fact it was more akin to exhausting the audience with an idea or a character. So and uh while I I did have a lot of material with um my Teddy figure um, dating back to when I was a kid and growing up in, in school and all, I, that material kind of seemed to phase itself out for several reasons. One, uh, I was uh, more mature, and the material was kind of, uh, well, more childlike, I suppose. And, um, and then I didn't have the experience of delivering that material over and over. So because I spent so many years doing production shows, I just uh, didn't have the amount of material that I needed. Now, mind you, I I could ad lib fairly well. Uh, when I was, I don't know, about 13 or 14, I think I'd memorized 1,001 one-liners by Robert Orton. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, however, 
<laughs> so those were just ad libs, and uh, they sometimes will tend to get you off a set script, and you can get lost, which was a very fearful thing for me. And you just you know, a couple of seconds on stage seems like a lifetime uh, of when you're when you draw a blank and you don't know what you said to last. Oh, definitely. Oh, my. Yeah. Definitely. Funnier moments to me, anyway, looking back, or when I just, uh, uh, I just was lost in, in the routine, didn't know I'd repeat myself. So, for me, personally, I preferred, you know, the book show, and, and it got me more work than anything else. I wasn't much into uh, doing concerts. The question is, and I don't. I, the question is, what then about repeat work? If it's the same, if it's the same routine, I, I mean that in in the most uh, uh, respectful way. Did they? Would they? Were there venues that wanted the same thing uh, year after year, the same routine, or was there a change to that? No, absolutely. The venue had seen me doing that uh, that twelve minute sketch, and that's what they wanted. They were very, very uh, clear about. You know, what I could do on stage. So stretching and or changing any of the material or characters was not really an option for me. Yeah. Um, I did, you know, try a few things uh, now and then, but um, I was quickly reprimanded saying, no, the agreement <laughs> was that you would do that 12-minute routine as seen at such and such a location. Um and, and so I, I kind of stuck to that. Uh, years later, when I worked the Catskills in New York, I was, um, I, I did, I think it was about 18 minutes with Francisco, and I didn't know that I was supposed to do a half an hour, and I wasn't prepared. So I came off saying, get back out to the entertainment director. said, get back out there. You got to do 35 minutes. Oh. So I went back out, and I was lost, and I ended up doing the act exactly the same over again. And strangely enough, the audience laughed the second time around, too. <laughs> That's so, awesome. That's got to be an awesome feeling that yeah. it's so entertaining <laughs> that uh, you, you can double dip like that. That's awesome. And so you yeah. talking all about the specificity of Francisco has made me very, very curious about this this little routine you put on the DVD that you can get at SammyKing.com to our listeners uh, with Old MacDonald. I'm not going to give away what it is because I want people to go and look it up and, and get the DVD and and, uh, and uh, be as surprised and as enjoying of the laughter as, as I uh, as I did. But what was the situation where you ended up doing the old McDonald routine? Well, it had been um, how I closed my act with Teddy uh, all through my school years. And um, then I said, wow, wouldn't it be great if, uh, if a small person <laughs> could do that? Yeah, <laughs> it would be a a little uh, surprise ending type thing. So, um, yeah, I, I went through quite a few. I did it for over a period of about 10 years in production shows, uh, Miami and Puerto Rico, uh, Lake Tahoe, places like that where I did a long run. Um, and I, I did expand the act, just to add that other piece to it. Which was a lot of fun for me. Oh yeah, it's a lot of fun to watch. It's it's such a it's such a unique piece. You're you're both the things that I've seen are just Francisco and uh, that piece are just incredibly unique and incredibly well done. And so it leads me into our last question that I have for you. Uh, what would you like to see in this community of ventriloquists and entertainers today? What's missing, or what used to be and isn't anymore? I mean, this is your forum to just speak directly to ventriloquists about what you would like to see. Uh, in the generations ahead? Well, I would love to actually see more of what I am seeing. Uh, the last five years I've attended uh, the conventions, and I'm amazed at the progress that the upcoming ventriloquists are doing and how they grow from year to year. That's all really good. Um, the best advice I could give an uh, event wanting to just be a professional working event and not as a second job would be to develop a character from life experiences and um, to be sure uh, as a performing event uh, work on learning 
learning how to bifurcate, you know, what Paul Winchell calls splitting, mm-hmm. because that's, that's really the fine line um, of, uh, of keeping a, a character alive, of keeping both characters, or two or three for that matter. It's not an easy thing to do. In fact, it's very difficult. But it's the one thing you can practice or, or choreograph. I'd like to see more of that because so many um, events are hung up on that lip movement thing. And it's great to not move your lips, and it's great to have many different voices and all of that, but I don't see a lot of um, uh, advanced tech as far as um, uh, maintaining two or more characters simultaneously. And uh, I would like to see more of that in the future. Uh, I guess Paul Winchell was one of the best at that. Uh, there have been and are a lot of you know great fans out there, but the up-and-coming ones that stress only technique, uh, you can only dazzle an audience so long and before, you know, they say, okay, you are a great technical ventriloquist, but now entertain me. And so uh, developing the character and endearing that character to the audience is certainly more important, in my opinion. And uh, I would like to see, uh, I guess practice is the one thing that there's no substitute for as far as getting experience. So... um, just um, time on the boards, and when you're not on stage, uh, time uh, rehearsing in front of a mirror, and um, certainly trying to keep you know, the characters alive, and being in an action and reaction mode. That's not an easy thing to do simultaneously, but uh, that's kind of where I drew the line on, on perfection or perfecting an act. And the only way you can really do that is just practicing. Absolutely. Very important. And you heard it from the master, everybody. Practice and practice splitting, bifurcating. It's it's very important. And uh, you're right. It's one of the things that we often don't think about in this world of, of uh, technique and character. And there's so much stuff thrown at us that just to kind of ground ourselves, you're absolutely correct. So thank you very much for your time, Sammy King. It was awesome speaking to you today. Thank you so much. Well, you're very welcome, Matt. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, keep on keeping. What you're doing for the art of ventriloquism is just wonderful. And uh, it's a growing, continuously growing art. So I'm very, very proud to have been a part of the history of it so far. And uh, good luck with it, huh? Thank you very much. Thank you again to Sammy King. What a special treat. And now, a preview of my interview next week in Hebron, Kentucky, as part of the Vent Haven Convention. I am so humbled to be able to bring you an episode of this program live from the stage at Vent Haven in front of a studio audience, if you will. It's going to be so much fun. I will be visiting with Jim Barber and Todd Oliver, talking about their journey in this art form. You may recall that I got to speak with them almost a year ago at Jim's Theater in Branson, Missouri. But I promise you, we barely scratched the surface, and there is so much more to talk about. So this is a conversation you do not want to miss. I guarantee it. For those of you attending Van Haven who would like to come see Ventriloquism Weekly live on stage, it will be Wednesday at 5 p.m. Please come and see us. I'll also be taking questions from the crowd, so have your questions ready. And there may even be a surprise or two. You never know what happens when you get me on a stage, (laughs) especially with other ventriloquists. It could get wacky. (laughs) I'm looking forward to getting out from behind a computer screen and seeing you in person. Let's have a lot of fun at Vent Haven in just over a week from today. And for those of you that can't make it, please don't worry. We haven't forgotten you. The full live-to-tape episode will be available the following Monday, July 21st, as a regular episode of Ventriloquism Weekly. I promise you, miss you, miss you, you, it will be up as a regular episode. So send in your questions ahead of time to Ventriloquism Weekly at gmail.com. And I mean it. I really want your input. I really want your input for questions for Jim and Todd. 
participate, please. I want to know what you would like me to ask. This is your program after all. And that's it for us this week. Next week, Chris Donahoe returns to tell us what we can expect from the hospitality side of things at Vent Haven this year. You may remember he came on the Monday before the Wednesday of the convention last year, so it's a bit of a tradition to have him back because socializing is just as important at Vent Haven as going to the lectures. So I'm looking forward to what he has to say. It'll be very exciting. A reminder, you can find all you need to know about Ventriloquism Weekly by visiting our website, ventriloquismweekly.com. Reach out by emailing ventriloquismweekly at gmail.com and find our group on Facebook by searching Ventriloquism Weekly hyphen podcast for ventriloquists. And please tweet us at talk for 2 and if you tweet about us, use hashtag talk for 2 T-A-L-K-F-O-R-T-W-O. Write everything out just like you're writing a script for a radio show. See how that works? <laughs> Signing off for Ventriloquism Weekly, I'm Matt Bailey, reminding all you vents out there to keep talking for two. <laughs>